Considered to be one of the scariest films of all time, the movie The Exorcist terrified the masses upon its release and brought the reality of the devil home to millions of people. Although the terror and special effects enhanced the story being portrayed, what if I told you that the story itself was inspired by a true story of demonic possession? Today, we will be discussing the very real story of a boy named Roland Doe and the demons that plagued him. You can decide for yourself what you believe as we open the X-Files here on Mystery Archives. The year was 1949 in a small town in Maryland, and our story begins as the boy known as Roland Doe is mourning the death of his beloved Anne. Aunt Millie's passing was very sudden, and the two had been extremely close. Millie was known for being an avid spiritualist, perhaps a new age person of her time, and was always very interested in things like spirits, the afterlife, and Ouija boards. Seeing this activity, the young Roland became very interested as well, and alongside his Aunt Millie, he was taught by her how to properly use a Ouija board over the summer of 1948. As Roland mourned her death, he rediscovered the Ouija board that she had given him as a present earlier that year, and in a moment of desperation, he attempted to speak with Aunt Millie once again. This activity many believed to be the catalyst for the events that would develop shortly after. Just days after, things began. The family started hearing a steady dripping sound with seemingly no origin, and this continued for about a week. Then the drips turned into thumps and scratches, both of which were seeming to come from everywhere inside the walls. The family first suspected mice, but had a well-known exterminator come out who found nothing. Things continued to escalate. Furniture began to move by itself, and other items were hurled across the room by an invisible force. A portrait of Jesus that hung on the wall began to rattle and shake as if it was being hit from behind. The happenings continued to grow with intensity, leading to a crescendo. The force seemed to move out of the walls and into Roland's room, into his bed. He was awakened to his bed shaking violently. He screamed for his mother who came in and experienced the terror as well. The family tried to decipher what was happening. They had Roland examined by a doctor and a psychiatrist. Both concluded that the young man was very stressed out, but otherwise healthy. Exactly one month after Millie's death, the activity began to escalate even more when markings seemed to materialize on the boy's body. The first marking spelled out the word Lewis. Frightened and trying to find a resolution, the family used the Ouija board to try and contact Millie. They made contact with something. As they asked for the spirit to prove that it was real, it hurled a chair across the living room. And this wasn't the only sign. The following morning, long burning welts appeared on Roland's legs, just as the previous markings had. The family now had to consider the unthinkable, that their son was perhaps in the grip of something demonic. They contacted their local pastor, who was a Lutheran, who came to the house to pray with the family. After he witnessed the marks appear on the young man's body, he suggested that the family contact the Catholic Church, since they deal with these kinds of things. The family tried to flee the area in hopes that the activity lay at the house, but after relocating with a family member in a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, the paranormal happenings continued. Frightened and not knowing what else to do, the family reached out to Father Bowden at the local Catholic parish, who after a lengthy discussion, wasn't convinced that the boy was possessed, but decided to pray over the boy to help ease the family's stress and just see if anything happened. 
he arrived at the house the following day with the company of Father Raymond Bishop. After meeting Roland, they all decided to pray together, and to the priest's great surprise, only several words in, Roland began to scream that his chest hurt, and upon opening the boy's shirt, they could see red cuts in the boy's skin begin to appear. Now scared, the priest began to pray over the boy more intensely, lasting from about 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. when Roland fell into a fitful sleep. The priests returned to their homes and then met the following morning. It was here that both men decided that they were dealing with the real deal and made a decision to pursue an exorcism. Father Bowder, who had formerly been an army chaplain during World War II, was about to go to war yet again. The father reached out to the Archbishop of St. Louis to ask permission to perform the rites of exorcism, which he was granted under one request, that he provide a day-to-day -day account for the church, to which he agreed. Each segment of the story from here on out is written with excerpts of what the priest documented of the situation. Father Bowder and Father Bishop returned to the residence and entered Roland's room. As soon as the ritual began, the boy began to violently act out. So with the help of the boy's father, it continued. It would be written out that the boy's blows were beyond that of his age. All seemed calm. The boy did not act out, but just peacefully slept. Perhaps last night's prayers were beginning to work, and that was until the priest left. The boy began to yell and scream at the top of his lungs for hours. Both priests returned, and with the assistance of both the boy's mom and dad, continued the ritual hour after hour. After about four hours of prayers, the boy began to lurch as if he was going to throw up. He quickly asked for the window near his bed to be opened, which the family did, and within minutes, Roland seemed normal. The family and the priest knelt down beside him and gave prayers of thanksgiving for what seemed like a triumph of good over evil. But from the Ritualum Romano, the Catholic guide for exorcism, sometimes the devil will leave the possessed person in peace to make it appear as if he has departed. The exorcist must see through this with the power of God and realize this trap. It's now 2 a.m. Father Bowder and his assistant have been gone for an hour. Roland's screams begin to fill the house. Priests are called back yet again and arrive at approximately 3.15 a.m. They return back to Roland's bedside where the boy begins taunting and screaming at the priests. He then goes catatonic around 6 a.m. and seems to be sleeping. The activity begins around 8.30 p.m. with various knocking noises, accompanied by Roland's screaming voice. The priests arrive at 9 p.m. and begin their prayers. There is now more violence than ever before. Roland is exerting strength beyond his normal capacity, barking and screaming in multiple octaves, as if there were two voices inside him. His mother breaks down. Father Bowder suggests that the boy be sent away to a worthy place where the exorcism can continue away from the boy's mother. He is then relocated to a hospital ran by an order of Catholic monks. And after strange happenings and his terrifying behavior his first night there, he is placed in a private room on a private floor above the psychiatric ward. Father Bowder returns the following evening with Father Bishop and the additional help of Father Hellerin. Hellerin, who was a young seminarian then, was tasked with the main job of restraining the boy, if need be, during the prayers. And during times where things were calm, he would visit with him and keep his spirits up. As the priest entered the room, Father Hellerin began visiting with Roland. And as Father Bowder blessed him with a small vial of holy water, he then placed the vial on the dresser next to the bed. Just a few seconds after this, the vial flew across the room and smashed into the wall. In a later interview, as the only surviving priest who witnessed the activity, Father Hellerlin stated that 
That's how I knew we were dealing with the real deal. You read about these kinds of things, but they never really happen. As the ritual formally began again, the boy began screaming and cursing the priests. He told Father Hellerin that his mother said hello from the depths of hell. This went on for hours until he finally went catatonic. The following day they resumed again, and Roland by this time was so violent that all three men were having a hard time holding him down. Aside from the multiple voices and curses, he began spitting a foul-smelling liquid at them as well. As the day continued, the boy was screaming that Father Hellerin was hurting him as he was restraining him. The young priest loosened his grip and was instantly punched in the face, breaking his nose. This concluded prayers for that day. For the family, the ordeal is an excruciating nightmare they can't wake up from. And for the priests, the task is exhausting. But despite the discouraging signs, the ritual continues. Roland becomes more violent, more angry, and also begins spontaneous urinations. More objects begin to move more regularly as the manifestations continue. On day 18, Roland asks for a pen and paper and writes, I am the devil himself, and within 10 days, I will give you a sign. Shortly after writing this down, he begins to scream as the Roman numeral 10 carves itself in his skin on his chest. Witnessing this, Father Bowder decides to baptize the boy to hopefully aid his crusade against the demons that plague him. The following day, with the boy's permission, he performs a baptism, which seemed to calm Roland down, but just ten minutes after, the boy returns to his fits, violence, and curses. Night after night, the praying continues, and night after night, the boy is still overwhelmed. As the prayers begin, Roland screams, and the word in capital letters is seen carved on his chest. Exit. Horrified, the priests continue on with their prayers. The devil now seems to be speaking through Roland's body. As he says, you need to say one more word, but you never say it. After the night's end at the hospital, the priests were puzzled as they pondered this strange statement. But as they consoled the book of exorcism, they realized that Father Bowder was forgetting to read the word Lord time and time again. This not only frightened the men further, but also affirmed their suspicions even more. It was a cold, rainy night as the priests arrived at the facility. They could immediately sense that something wasn't right. From the parking lot, they could see that the lights on the floor that Roland was placed were flickering on and off in different rooms. As they checked in at the front desk, the clerk broke down in tears, trying to explain that things were especially bad. As they approached the boy's room, they noted a strong sulfuric smell coming from inside. And unlike previous nights, as soon as they entered the room, Roland began cursing at them in fluent Latin. He had never displayed foreign tongues before, and as the priests began the ritual again, Roland stated that this was their sign. Father Bowland then commanded the spirit to prove itself, to which the boy smiled and touched the priest's purple vestment, and it burst into hundreds of individual fibers. Now with their worst fears realized, the priests began to pray harder than they had ever prayed before. During the struggle, Roland broke a bed spring and attempted to stab Father Bowder. He thrashed, urinated, and screamed in dual octaves. Five hours into the prayers this night, he began to levitate up and out of the bed, only his newly tied restraints keeping him tethered. And after seven grueling hours, the boy exclaimed that he saw St. Michael the Archangel use a flaming sword to drive the devil away, and with this, he fell silent. After this long and arduous night, 
what began 28 days ago, seemed to have finally been worth it. Roland slowly but surely returned to normal, and in fact went on to live a rather ordinary life. The records of the events from those 28 days somehow were leaked to the press, and became an embarrassment for both the priests and the man who was involved, to which Father Bowder has always regretted Roland's confidentiality being violated. William Peter Blatty, who had heard about the case, became extremely intrigued and reached out to the priest to discuss it with him. When asking Bowder if he knew if the whole thing was real or not, he replied, I had no doubt about it then, and I have no doubt about it now. What was in that room that night was the otherworldly force we call the devil in the flesh. William Peter Blatty took his inspiration from the case and wrote the book The Exorcist. So, was the possession case of Roland Doe a genuine one? It was considered to be one of the most substantial cases, if not the most substantial case by the Catholic Church in the last 300 years. By others, it was just an emotionally compromised adolescent who was acting out after the death of a close loved one. But what do you think? Make sure to let me know down in the comments below, subscribe with the bell if you are new here, and share this video on social media. If you like these kinds of mysteries, show me by hitting the like button. Check out our Patreon for behind the scenes content and unique rewards. And dive into another mystery now by checking out one of our other videos on screen. If you made it to the end, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Thank you so much for watching and have yourself a wonderful day.